So as I said at the beginning of service that uh, this is the first Sunday of the new year. And when we think about um, approaching a new year, uh, for a lot of people, the new year brings a lot of excitement, a lot of opportunities, just, ex just excited about the possibilities uh, that uh, this year can bring, the possibilities of what God can do in our lives and in the lives of His churches and in the lives of others. Uh, but there are some people who, when they approach the new year, there's a lot of fear, a lot of dread when it comes to the new year, not knowing what the year may bring, and especially looking back to 2019, um, just thinking about some of those things, and maybe some of those things that roll over to the next year can give people some, some great dread, not looking forward to the new year. But as we begin to journey into the new year, it's important for us to not only be optimistic about what the year will unfold, but also reflecting on the past. As we look at the past, we can look at the successes and the shortcomings in life and be able to improve on them so that when we go into the new year, we can continue to build ourselves up and continue to build and transform our lives, uh, being able to improve in our business endeavors and even maybe even to be able to strengthen relationships we have with people. The same thing can be said about our relationship with Jesus and even the nature of the church. And I want us to go ahead and look at our verse of Ezekiel 36, 26 and read that again. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You know, the Israelites during Ezekiel's day were in captivity. And the reason why they were in captivity because of their own sinfulness and, and turning their hearts away from the Lord. And we see that each year they probably thought that the next year was just going to be the same old, same old, being imprisoned, being enslaved, being in captivity, and that there was no hope. But we see the message from the Lord through the prophet Ezekiel that there is hope, that there is going to be a day when the Lord is going to pour out His Spirit upon them and transform their hardened hearts into a heart that is filled with the Holy Spirit. When we allow the Lord to give us a new spirit-filled heart, it then propels us to be able to move forward with the mission and vision that Christ gives his people, the church. With that being said, we also have the responsibility to understand cultural trends that are trends that are happening in our world today that can either help or hurt the movement of the church. Um, I had a wonderful time uh, being back home in Ohio and got to celebrate my dad's birthday. He was a New Year's baby, and he just turned 60 this year, so uh, that was um, quite a milestone, especially I mentioned before that after my dad started getting older than when his father passed away uh, due to a car accident in his early 50s, you know, each year he gets older. It's a little more weird for him, just surpassing the age of his father. Uh, but one thing, as I was talking to my dad, I began to ask him because when my niece was little, my dad made a, a promise that when he, he wants to be healthy enough to be able to take uh, my niece to go to whitewater rafting. So I went to my dad, I said, oh, so are we ready to do a whitewater rafting tip with Brianna yet? And my dad goes, no, she still has a couple more years left, but I'm still planning on taking her. Um, but I was thinking about the last time I went whitewater rafting and all the years I've gone, and it's such a wonderful experience, but it's also a great allegory for life. You know, a lot of times, you know, when you think about life, it's like going down a river, and sometimes there are some rocky rivers, some rapids that we have to try to overcome in life. But when I think about everything about the uh, whitewater rafting experience, you have the river, you have the rapids, you have the boat, you have the people in the boat, you have the oars, but most importantly, you have the guide. And the guide has this big, long oar, and even before you start hitting the rapids, the guide's teaching you the basics. Here's how you paddle. Here's the correct way to paddle. And I can remember there would be times where he would say, okay, there's this rapid that's going to be coming up. And you can look out across the water and you see nothing. It looks like it's still water. I'm like, there's no rapid coming up. And the guy would say, trust me, the rapid's there. But here's how we're going to approach it. Here's how we're going to attack it. And here's some of the danger spots in case if you find yourself outside of the boat, get back in the boat, or swim to safety. 
And as it's going, and as we start approaching those rapids, and you start seeing the roaring water, you start to get a little afraid the first time you do it. But then if your ear is attuned to the guide, and the guide's leading you down those rapids, most of the time, you are always going to find success traveling down the river. I think out of all the times I have been whitewater rafting, I have never once got thrown out of the boat. Fingers crossed. But I think that's how it goes, especially in life, but even in the church as a follower, if we tune our ears to the guide, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to listen to both his guidance and his instructions on how we need to tackle life, how we need to live out the mission of Jesus Christ and live out his word and his gospel. So the first cultural trend I've been seeing is that we're losing the middle. What does that mean, losing the middle? On a business side, we see that fast food restaurants, dollar stores, even um, cheap stuff you can buy through apps like Wish.com, uh, that those stores are doing great business. On the other side, your expensive restaurants, your high-end stores that sell $700 purses, those too are doing great business. But in the middle, we're seeing that a lot of your mom and pop shops are not doing so well. Those who are kind of have a good, even amount of price. People either want cheap goods or they want excessive, high quality goods. Especially when it comes to relationships, we see the same thing. I can remember being in high school and it didn't matter if it was math, science, um, German, which it happened in German class a lot, which is why I probably don't know much German as I do now. Uh, but the teacher would say, hey, let's talk about some hot topic issues, because I want to know what you think about certain things. So we discussed everything from abortion to war ethics to everything. And I can remember sitting in a class of 30 people and just having a discussion about whatever topic that the professor or the teacher wanted us to talk about. And we could hear a variety of different of opinions, but never once were people criticized for their beliefs. And at the end of the day, when we, the bell would ring and we'd go to our next class, we were still making plans to on homework assignments, to get together and work on groups, or even just to go and play basketball after school. There seemed to be almost a relationship where even our difference of opinions didn't destroy us. But so much now we're seeing that even having a difference of opinion with someone else means that you are criticized and you are torn apart. And if there's one thing I do not look forward to this year, I do not look forward to the election this year, not because of the election, but because of seeing family members being torn apart over politics, seeing churches being torn apart over the difference of opinion in politics. And I even know some people in 2016 who have left the church because the minister was too busy preaching politics than preaching the word of God. So we see that there is no middle. So what does it mean to be in the middle? Well, I want you to have your Bibles. I want you to turn to Acts 2, 42 to 47. What does it mean to be in the middle? Acts 2, 42 through 47 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When I read this passage, every time I read this passage of Scripture, this is where I see the empowered church. We already saw Pentecost happen, so this is a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what were some of the key characteristics of this church? That this church was teachable. This church was unified. This church was relational. And most importantly, the early church was sincere. I look, at this, I look at this church because I'm just so blown away by how everyone was able to get together. And they always wanted to be with each other. That every time when there was an event or something was happening, whether they're having dinner at someone's house or they were praising God in the synagogues, wherever the case may be, 
They enjoyed each other's company. They fellowship with glad and sincere hearts. The only thing that unified, even though they had differences, the one thing that unified them was Jesus Christ and his gospel and the Holy Spirit. And this church was able to bring people into the fold by proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And more people were being saved by the gospel message. We looked at it into comparison. To, and I want to take this early church and I want to compare it to the church of Odisha in Revelations 3, 14 through 22. And it says, To the angel of the church of Odisha writes, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, the thing about being in the middle is that people who are in the middle, they don't go the extra mile. I mean, think about how many of you have ever had to call someone about, had to call customer service for anything. Most of us probably have. And you know the great quality, and you know what's the difference between a place that you will buy stuff again from and a place that you won't buy stuff again? Is how they handle customer service. If you go and you make a phone call and you have to sit on the phone and keep dialing press 1, press 3, press 5, press 6. Type in 25. Take a number. I'll get back to you. That's not the type of customer service we like. But the customer service you do like is when you call someone and someone actually answers the phone. You may have to hit a number or two, but someone's there to talk with you, to help you, to guide you, and to help you be able to fix whatever problem you have. You see, in the church today, we're kind of in the middle. We don't see a lot of churches that are willing to go the extra mile. I think back in Jesus' teaching when he talks about what it means to be a follower. He says, if someone strikes you on your one sheet, turn so they strike you on the other. If one asks you for your coat, give them your shirt as well. If one demands you to walk a mile, walk with them too. You know, the thing, that's, the thing about being, and when we look at the church of Odisha, they were just kind of in the middle. They were neither hot nor cold. And because they were neither hot nor cold, God was going to spit them out of his mouth. So what does it mean to be hot? Well, we live in a world that is so connected digitally. But we are disconnected relationally. And the one thing that I've been seeing a lot of um, in, this, in our communities is that there's a lot of people who hunger and thirst for meaningful, genuine relationships. Even though social media is a great thing and it's a wonderful thing, people have lost the ability to have meaningful, genuine relationships, person-to-person -person contact. So the thing is, is if we want to be the empowered church, we have to be able to be intentional. We have to be sincere. We have to be relational with people so that people can not only feel like they are connecting with other people and feel love, but through that connection with the believer, they too can experience Jesus Christ through our words and through our actions. The second cultural thing we see is that DIY, do it yourself, is giving away to DIFM, do it for me. I remember I had a six hour commute to college and I would usually drive from Anderson back to Akron, Ohio. And usually I'd have to stop and get gas, but there was one particular travel back home where I was just, my stomach was rumbling, I hadn't eaten anything yet, I wasn't feeling good, and I stopped at this gas station and there was no restaurants in sight, I really just wanted to get back home. So I go and I pump gas and I go to the counter to pay for it, and as I'm in there, I could have got like the Slim Jims and the Doritos, but I wanted something a little bit more substantial. 
And on the side, there was a little tiny deli counter, and there was one sandwich available for a dollar, and it was a ham salad sandwich. Now, logic would tell me to avoid the ham salad sandwich for a dollar at a gas station, but I was desperate, so I bought it. And I ate it, and my goodness, I paid for it when I got home. But when we look at our, when we look at our grocery stores now, you can walk into a grocery store, and you can pretty much buy anything you want. But just for chicken, you don't have to make it. You can just buy it. Someone had already done the work for you. You can go to a grocery store and there's a hot food bar so you can get yourself a plate of chicken, mashed potatoes, green bean, and that can be your lunch, or a salad. We say, and you know what's another fascinating about our culture today? You can go to the store and you can buy pre-sliced apples. Imagine your grandparents or your great-grandparents, and if you were to tell them that in 2020 that you can buy pre-sliced apples, they would probably say, well, why can't you just use a knife and an apple? <laughs> but the thing we're seeing in our culture is we have a culture of people who are so busy, who are so overworked, who are so, you know, just at their wit's end that it's just easy for them to have people do it for them. Even if we think about food, I can go to I can go to fast food and get someone make someone can make me a burger and can buy it. But now I can call somebody, I can use an app like Uber Eats or DoorDash, and someone else can go pick up my food for me. And I don't have to leave my house. We see we live in a culture where everything's about, well, I want someone to do something for me. I want someone to do things for me. But when we look at the scriptures, we all have a responsibility to live out our faith. Uh, turn to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. When I read that verse, it makes me think of whitewater rafting, which I'm probably going to use that word a lot uh, today. But when I'm in the boat and the guy is telling me to row forward, to row backwards, I have to listen to that boat. Because that's the person who has authority. That's the person who is going to try to get me to the end of this river. So here we see that Jesus, all authority and power has been given to him. So Jesus can do anything he wants to do. But he tells his people to go and make disciples. To go and baptize people to go and teach them everything that Jesus had taught them. We, as believers, we have a responsibility in proclaiming the gospel message. If we look at 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The Apostle Paul is basically telling the church, the church in Corinth, saying, we are Christ's ambassadors. We, basically, God is moving through us, making his claim through us to present the gospel to you so that you can be reconciled back to God. So it is all on us to proclaim the gospel message. It is on us to be able to tell people about Jesus Christ because we have gotten so comfortable in our culture today where I don't have to tell people about Jesus. I can have the Sunday school teacher do that. I can have my other family member who's a Christian who can do that. I can have the pastor do that. Especially when it comes to diving into the Word. I don't need to read the Bible. I can have my teacher tell me that. Pastor can tell me what the Bible says. I don't need to read it. Someone else can do it for me. But if we want to grow in our relationship with Christ, we have to do it ourselves. And sure, having a teacher and having a pastor and having an elder teach you things, that's a great bonus. But we are all responsible for our own spiritual growth and our spiritual um, and our faith development, even the proclaiming of the gospel. I want us to look at John 15, 26-27 uh, before I go to our next uh, part. It says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. 
You know, I find that fascinating when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth, one to help us recall what Jesus had said, uh, someone who moves us in a way to be able to present Jesus um, in a very adequate way. And I think one of the great things about this scripture is that even though the Spirit is going to tell the world about the truth of Jesus Christ, but we have a part to play in it. When the Spirit came, it wasn't to the side to say, okay, Spirit, you go tell everybody. No. All the apostles went out and started proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And has passed that down to each and every one of us. So again, we want to be a DIY community. We want to make sure that we too are presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the reality is, is I'm not going to be able to have the same relationship and connections with other people that you know who don't know Christ. But because of the relationship you have, you have the power and you have the responsibility to give the healing message of love and hope of Jesus Christ to those you meet. And then finally, the last thing we've been seeing in our culture is that insight and access has been more valuable than content. And I'll say that again. Insight and access has become more valuable than content. How did we gain information 30 years ago? What about? What was that? What about? You have to work them out. You have to go and buy something, buy a book. By, uh, well, 30 years ago. See, I don't remember. Did we still have DVDs 30 years ago? I don't remember. I think we did, or they were coming up. Oh, gosh, guys. I don't know anymore. I still think I'm like 15. But we used to have to pay money to get information. We had to buy books. We had to read DVDs. We paid money to go to conferences so we can learn how to do things. But with the explosion of the digital age, we now have podcasts, video blogs, YouTube, TED Talks that basically tell us a lot of content. Even now, sometimes I don't even have to search for content. I can walk onto social media and there's a bunch of news stories right there for me to look at. I don't even have to go anywhere to find content. So we have access to a lot of content. Sometimes this might be overwhelming sometimes to sort through on figuring out what actually has truth to it or not. But when we think about all the content, the things that we are missing is insight and access. And when we think about what is insight, well, insight gives meaning to the content that we are partaking. I want us to go ahead and look at John, a couple of verses. I want us to look at John 14, 16 through 21. John 14, 16 through 21, it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Now I bring up this verse because we see a lot of times in John, Jesus is always talking about his relationship with the Father. And now that Jesus is going away and he's going to be ascending back up to heaven after his betrayal and his crucifixion and resurrection, he is basically telling his disciples that there is going to be a helper, an advocate, the Holy Spirit who's going to be with you, who's going to teach you and all of these things, going to remind you everything that I have taught you. So everything about here is relational. But the thing is, is if we want to gain knowledge and wisdom from the Lord, we have to be connected to the Lord. I want us to look at Luke 5, uh, Luke 11, 52. And it says, Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not endured, and you have hindered those who were entering. So what is the key to knowledge? What is the key to knowledge? Well, the answer to what Jesus is talking about actually goes back to Isaiah 33, 6. 
And Isaiah 33, 6 says this, He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. So what is this key that Jesus is talking about, this idea to access wisdom and knowledge? Well, it's the fear of the Lord. It's having that relationship with God. It's about working and growing and continuing to be the best representative, the best ambassador of Jesus Christ as we can be with much fear and trembling. Because when, the, because when I think about the empowered church in Acts 2, I think of a church that was always working on being a better version of themselves. Not just being a better version of themselves for themselves' sake, but being an embodiment of Jesus Christ, being a reflection of who He is, living out His teachings, living out His fruits, living out the fruits of the Spirit in their lives. So we see that's where we get insight. That's where we get content by connecting to the Lord. The other thing is access. And when we really think about what access is, access is value. When you connect with the Lord, then you gain His wisdom. And when you connect to the spiritual life of the church, you gain much more value. You gain knowledge. You gain relationships. You gain love and support. You gain encouragement. You know, it's interesting because I've been seeing statistics and we're seeing a lot more that the lesser the number, the greater the value. I know that I'm, I'm part of a vinyl club um, and occasionally there's some of these old records of bands I used to listen to when I was a teenager. It's like, oh, this album's coming out on vinyl now. It's like, but they're only going to make a hundred of them. So a lot of people who really like that band, you know what they're doing? They're staying up late till past midnight, making sure that thing comes on that website so they can buy their copy. When I think about the concept of value, I think about learning from knowledge, gaining wisdom. So let me pitch this question to you real quick. If you had an opportunity to hear your favorite author or your favorite Christian speaker or somebody that you really like, someone that you may have a question about, a recent book they like, or a teaching that they're teaching from the Word, would you rather do that in an auditorium of 6,000 people? Or would you rather do it in a bookstore during a Q&A of 50 people to answer some of the questions you may have? What's more valuable to you? The bookstore. Most of us would say the bookstore, because at least you know your question would get answered. At least you know that you can actually have a meet and greet with your favorite author. You can see them, you can touch them, you can get your picture taken with them, get a selfie with them. But in a room of 6,000 people, even though you may be able to engage with your favorite uh, speaker, and you may be able to learn from them, if you had any questions or you needed to want to really talk to them, you wouldn't be able to do it because there's, so, because there's a competition. There's so many people there for such a short amount of time. One of my students uh, goes to a uh, university in North Carolina pursuing a musical uh, theater degree. And as she was down there, she was trying to find a church to belong to. And there was a couple people who were messaging her and talking to her saying, hey, you should come and, and check out Elevation. You should come and check out Elevation. So she's like, okay. You know, she was building a relationship with these people through online means. So she gets to Elevation and she attends service and she tries to find the people that have been talking to her and when she would find them, they said, oh, sorry, I can't talk to you right now. I have to do this or I have to do this promo video or I have to get this ready for service or I have to do this. So she walked in and she said, you know, the service was fine, the music was fine, you know, the teaching was fine. But she felt like she didn't have access. The people who had invited her in didn't even want to spend time with her because they were too busy doing other things for the church. So she ended up going to a church of about 30 people. And she went there and she said it was a great time because even though she occasionally she'll go to Elevation occasionally, but this smaller church was her home church because she had people who loved her, who support her, who encouraged her to read the word and also would feed the word into her. And what we're seeing so many times is we're seeing so many churches that want to try to be big churches. But really, we see that there's so much value in small churches because we can be relational. But the problem is the smaller churches are not willing to go the extra mile to be relational with people. 
And yet we see a world where people are hungering and thirsting for genuine relationships. And this is the perfect opportunity to meet those needs and to meet those people. So as we approach this year, we need to be a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And throughout this month, we'll continue to talk about what it means to be an empowered church. But I want to ask you questions a couple of questions to think for yourselves, uh, both as an individual and both collectively as a congregation. You know, do we want to be the type of Christ follower that gains wisdom from the Lord through His Word and through a relationship with Jesus Christ and by the power of His Holy Spirit? Do we want to be missional by sharing and living out our faith in the communities and the relationships that we build within our circles? And do we as Christ followers continue on to build up the body of Christ? And as a church, do we want to gain wisdom from the Lord and from His Word? Do we want to be missional by sharing and living out our faith in our communities? Do we want to continue to build the body of Christ up and encourage and build one another up? Because if we do that, then we will be an empowered church that will be powerful and effective in anything that we do to lead people to Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. God, we thank you for the many blessings you have given us, Lord. God, we just thank you uh, for your spirit, God. And Lord, it's just kind of hard as we have a culture that is moving very quickly and is always changing. It's very hard to kind of pinpoint and see what are some of the things in our culture that might be seeping into the church, Lord. Some of the good things, but also some of the bad things as well, Lord. And God, right now, my prayer for this year is that we become empowered people by your Holy Spirit. That we become empowered people that are able to build, be relational, and be sincere with those around us. Of those that we need, whether it's by chance, uh, whether it's by accident or whether it's by relationships we've had with people for years. Lord, we just pray that we be the type of people that you will not spit out of your mouth, but we'll be the type of people that will be hot, the people that will go out and really proclaim the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, so that other people may be able to find hope and hopelessness, Lord. And especially at a time where in New Year's, where, uh, where the year for some people this year may be filled with dread and the unknown, but... As your believers, we're able to connect with those people and give them hope through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. God, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to work on our hearts, to transform our hearts from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for the pouring out of your Holy Spirit on each and every one of our lives, that we can be an empowered people, an empowered church, to do your mission, to do your will, to live out your vision, to reach those in our communities. And to all these things we pray in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Again, these altars are open for any prayer needs that you have, whether it's through salvation, whether it's through healing.